Hello and welcome to this episode of Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice number 47. And this time the question is, what role, if any, do dreams have in a Buddhist practice? So this is a, a very interesting question and I know um, in some previous talks and articles we've touched upon this subject um, elsewhere on the Zen Gateway um, but I think it's useful to return to it because certainly as I'll go into a little bit later my own late teacher um, did have at a time a fondness for uh, dreams and dreams interpretation so um, I think what has to be said is that I've not come across any particular formal uh, practice of using dreams. I know in some of the Tibetan schools uh, there is a thing called dream yoga uh, which is a, f a series of formal practices connected with uh, lucid dreaming uh, but we don't have anything that formal um, in Zen uh, but certainly dreams have appeared um, obviously in the Buddhist scriptures and in the Zen teachings um, as well um, and that's simply because um, you know China and India and Japan uh, and Southeast Asia in the same way that the ancient world here um, in the West um, put great emphasis on dreams and, and saw dreams as you know being messages um, obviously in the West from God, but in the East from the Buddhas or from um, other such, you know, sources of great wisdom. But I think, you know, we may as well start by just taking a quick um, look through a, a couple of examples uh, from the scriptures. Of course, if we go into the life of the Buddha, then the Buddha's own conception uh, was heralded by a dream. Uh, his mother, Queen Maya, had a dream of a large six-tusked white elephant that came up to her, entered into her left side, um, and when she woke up from this dream and told the sort of you know the wise men at court, uh, they realised that this was a dream of great portent. Uh, and shortly afterwards, when she fell pregnant, um, they connected the two things together and realized this was a great and auspicious birth. So in this particular story, um, the message or the signal from the dream is that this upcoming event, the, the birth of uh, Prince Gautama, uh, will, be a extra, will be a very significant event and hence why uh, the child was, you know, given a horoscope and uh, uh, when it came back that he would either be a great world teacher or a religious sage you know king um, uh, 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 the king his father took uh, took matters into his own hand and that set off a whole train of events obviously which led up to the Buddha uh, sitting under the Bodhi tree becoming enlightened and then turning the wheel of the Dharma. So the dream was not only very significant, not only did it sort of passively portend something, not only did it herald also a miraculous birth, because if you remember, he, the, the, the baby Buddha emerged from his mother's right side, the elephant having entered from the left-hand side. Um, it also uh, played a role in its, itself in guiding uh, the decisions necessary to push uh, Prince Gautama to undergo the great renunciation and embark on his spiritual path. So um, it's not only, as I say, a, a portent or an omen, but it also has agency. This, is, this dream had agency in the story of the Buddha um, himself. And we can see, I mean, that so uh, the dream as portent is certainly something that you know, uh, featured many times in, in many different stories. But interestingly, the dream itself uh, is not just the sort of, you know, like a sort of newspaper from the future with, uh, uh, which has no role. It, um, that as a result of that portent, it actually creates a future um, as well. And, um, you know, I'm thinking that, for example, in, in some of the stories from the records of the transmission of the lamp, which um, is, uh, are the stories, the life stories, the biographies of some of the very early uh, Zen masters in China. Um, there are a number of, you know, again, this sort of heralded birth 
um, heralded by a dream or strange lights in the sky or whatever, uh, which suggests some kind of, you know, um, great birth that is being signified in this. These events were often told legendarily or accumulated to the legends of the great uh, Zen masters and dreams certainly uh, formed some of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, that signaling as well. Um, also, I mean, not just in Buddhism, I'm just thinking there's a that very famous quote from uh, the um, Taoist uh, sage, um, uh, Zhuang Zhe, uh, where he talked of dreaming that he was a butterfly and then waking up and not knowing if he is um, if he was a man who dreamt he was a butterfly or if he is now a butterfly who's simply dreaming of being a man. And so th uh, this lays out an insight because this is pointing to, you know, the uh, the nature of reality or the nature of delusion as well that we take the waking world as being real in inverted commas and the dream world as being unreal and you know Zhuang, Zhuang Se's dream is questioning that assumption as well and of course this also bleeds into as I say some of the dream yoga practices of the um, uh, Indian Mahayanists and also the Tibetans um, as well where they also you know investigate that particular insight. Um, there's also actually uh, um, a story of not the Buddha as such but if you know your Buddhist scriptures you'll have heard of the Jataka tales which are the previous birth stories of the Buddha um, and uh, the, this is how the, the Buddha acquired the merit to uh, un to uh, become a Buddha in his final incarnation as Shakyamuni, uh, Prince uh, Gautama. Um, and in one of the earlier stories, uh, the great Bodhisattva is called on to interpret 16 calamitous dreams of one of the kings of India. Um, who was terrified by them and the Buddha um, goes through these 16 dreams again which are in fact forecasting the future um, uh, but not the immediate future he's actually talking about the uh, these 16 dreams as it were symbolize the the end of the current uh, world system and how everything degrades and the relationships between the king and his people and the um, old and the young and parents and children how that all decays um, uh, before the world system uh, comes to an end and the king had dreamt of that and he was terrified because he thought this was all going to happen to him right now and the Buddha reassured him that this was uh, not to be the case but it allows the Buddha to give an exposition on um, really the importance of these relationships, um, things like family, um, things like state to the people, the king to the people, um, between old and young, and actually towards the end even between humans and animals because the Buddha, um, because as a result of these dreams the Brahmins were doing mass sacrifices of, of animals and the Buddha puts a stop to it saying these are all, you know, um, not only unnecessary uh, but uh, beside the point they have nothing to do with these 16 dreams and don't avert any evil or as such because these things are inevitable because all things are subject to change so these are just a few examples where you know dreams appear in the scriptures and in the legends and stories uh, and so forth and that they can appear as portents they can appear as insights um, as well and that they can have agency so that they can affect the present of the dreamer um, they can be taken uh, uh, notice of so and as I said you know dreams and portents uh, like this um, in the ancient world was you know very normal um, the ancient Greeks obviously were particularly good at this they had their god Asclepius who was the the god of medicine and you know if you were sick you would go to the temple of Asclepius make your offering and then they would have a, a dream incubation chamber you go and you would sleep in this chamber in the temple and ask the god to you know give you a dream a healing dream or you know a, a, a dream that would tell you how to cure your sickness and this was you know a method that was used what's interesting as well is uh, even in you know uh, my own country here in um, Britain um, in the Iron Age we have 
you know what are called these long barrows, uh, which are basically just repositories for uh, funerary ashes. So people were cremated, their remains were put into pots, and these pots were put into these long barrows, which are really just sort of like long earthworks. And they were they're generally on a sort of east-west axis, with the doorway facing east, presumably because that's where the sun rises, and that signifies rebirth. Um, and uh, what was also discovered was that these long barrows weren't sealed. In fact, they were often open for, you know, um, dozens of years, sometimes a, a century or two. And then they may be closed and then they may be opened up again as well. And it's thought that, in fact, they may have been used um, rather in the same way as the Temple of Asclepius is, because, you know, these are the sanctuaries of the ancestors and generally ancestors are seen as having the repository of wisdom of the tribe so you know if you had a question you could do this you know they may well have had a, also had a practice of dream incubation um, where you go and you ask the dead or the god or whatever um, for an answer to a particular question so they're here you have an interaction. You see, um, dreams are not just something given and we are sort of passive beholders of a dream. We can actually ask for a dream, you know, to, for a particular, uh, uh, um, to, to solve a particular problem. So again, this is something that is done, you know, east and west all over the place. In fact, it's really only um, our site, uh, sort of our current um, uh, uh, society i suppose that that in in sort of recent times maybe we could say recent centuries uh really began to marginalize and ignore dreams and just saw them as sort of epiphenomena you know something that happens you know in the brain um of the person who is asleep of course what's interesting as well i'm sure those of you with dogs and cats will know that um, they also dream um as well and you can actually you know um I've watched my own cat uh, possibly chasing something, but certainly seeming to react to things uh, that he sees presumably in a dream. Um, so, and anyway, you know, no reason why humans should be the only creatures that, that dream. Um, you know, we're not that different. So, yes, so um, it, it, I know that sometimes, you know, if you look up sort of dreaming in sort of modern sort of textbooks or on, on to do with you know I don't know neurology or whatever. Normally they're, they're sort of treated with in a sort of mechanistic way that there's some kind of I don't know reordering of information or sorting of memories. I've seen both of those sort of given, and you know that may well you know that's there's not saying that that isn't happening. Uh, and what is important to say is is that in the ancient world, not every dream was considered portentous. You know, um, so you had what Jung came to call the, the uh, Swiss psychologist Carl Jung came to call big dreams and then ordinary dreams. Although, you know, um, ordinary dreams too um, can be very fruitful if we, you know, ponder them. Um, certainly, um, I found that to be the case in my own experience. Um, but yes, it's it's certainly it's certainly a thing, and uh, I, I think um, you know obviously that it's not to say that dreams are are not considered as important in our in our culture. Uh, they are, and and really that was sort of revived, I think, um, mainly by Freud, and then you know Carl Jung uh, afterwards as well, who took it in a different direction. Obviously, Freud, he didn't invent the term unconscious. It was there previous to him but he really did consolidate this notion that there is this unconscious um, aspect of the psyche of which consciousness is not directly aware and so he called dreams the royal road to the unconscious and he had a system of dream interpretation and wrote a very famous book on it um, and he had a very specific method as you know in, in treating with dreams but for him you know the dreams were entirely personal um, so the material in the unconscious um, and the forms it took in dreams um, really just reflected you know usually repressed um, impulses um, that had gone bad or 
neurotic uh, and then had to be excavated and dealt with and you know Jung, Jung took that and ran with it further and said yes you know um, there is the personal unconscious but then he he also posited what he called the collective unconscious and this is the realm of the archetypes and that some dreams the big dreams um, you know have archetypal elements in them um, and that these dreams are he equated as being of the same kind as you know these portentous dreams um, or insightful dreams uh, that have been seen you know previously um, in in the ancient world that we've been sort of discussing previously um, yeah I think um, I mean, I, I don't, you know, if, for those who are interested, obviously go and read Freud and Jung. There's plenty of literature out there. Um, I'm a big fan of Jung, as those of you who know me uh, will know. Um, but certainly, you know, he, he wasn't the only one. There's, there's lots of interesting material out there. In fact, what we, we will do, um, we'll also below this, uh, uh, below this podcast or below the video, we'll put a link to, there's, there's, was recently a, an interesting episode of, a, there's a, a podcast called this Jungian life uh, and they did a very interesting episode on the subject dream incubation uh, somewhat they were interviewing someone who had written a book on the subject um, and you know if you're interested you can hop over and have a listen to that well worth it I, I found it very interesting um, as well you might even want to try it um, they give the instructions there um, but I thought what I, I would say is that I'd probably just talk of, just really to finish off this subject, um, is is talk a little bit about a couple of instances myself, or, or in particular one dream uh, that I had that um, was insightful and seemed to speak to a certain, you know, the time when I had the dream. And I think that's something that's very important when I've been looking at my own dreams, for example, um, is to recognize that when you have the dream is very important um, you know the dream isn't you know haphazard it, it, it's often happening in response to something that is is happening in waking life at this time and uh, I remember you know a good few years ago uh, in my own training I'd been in the uh, Zen group and going to the temple for a few years and was well settled in the training uh, but as happens from time to time, you know, my eye began to stray a little bit and I was sort of becoming, looking around at some other things um, as well. And then one night I had this dream that I was at the temple and at the temple at that time and as now, the, um, the shrine room where we did the morning chanting was downstairs in the basement and I was down in that basement. So, you know, here I was in this sort of underground realm, if you like, and it felt, you know, chthonic um, in that way. And uh, my teacher was there and she was in the small shrine room and she, she used to sit on a large chair um, against, uh, opposite the shrine. Um, on the other wall and there was a cushion uh, and she as I walked in she indicated that I should go and kneel on the cushion in chanting position which I, I did and she said to me we're going to do some uh, different chanting today and she indicated that I should look under the mat because under the mat we used to put the sutra sheet with all the you know, the, uh, the, uh, with the chants on so that we could chant through. Only instead of the usual sutra sheet, what I found there was this uh, piece of stone, uh, like a length of stone, a bit like a sort of lintel uh, of sort of grey stone. Um, and this stone had been carved uh, into a series of sort of humanoid figures you know, one next to the other, a bit like a fres a bit like a, a frieze, you know, all these figures. And I realized that looking at them, that these were the patriarchs, these were the Zen patriarchs. And, um, you know, instead of having their names written on the sutra sheet, which is how they are in waking life, there they were on this large piece of long piece of stone all individually carved out and, and they were very sort of hemmed in pushed shoulder to shoulder uh, and so we started chanting um, 
what's called the lineage. It's called the Te Dai Denpo. This is the uh, chanting the names of the Buddhas and then the Indian patriarchs, the Chinese patriarchs, and then the Japanese patriarchs, um, and so on. And uh, as we were chanting, and, and it was a very different chant to the one that we normally do, as I, as I chanted each name of the patriarch, there was this sort of slightly eerie glow. Uh, each image began to sort of glow as I mentioned its name, and then I mentioned the next name, or I recite, chanted the next name, and the next image would glow, and so on and so on. And it worked its way along. And what I realized from this was that the lineage is made of a single piece of stone uh, that, although it's carved into different forms, um, uh, 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 each form shares the same substance. You know, in this case, this this stone, uh, and that imagery, that symbolism, came through very clearly to me in the dream. And then at the end of it, uh, Miyokioni sort of indicated that I should leave. And as I walked out, she said, and don't forget to put 50 pence in the box, in the donation box for the Buddha and for Bodhidharma. Of course, the Buddha is the original founder, uh, the first of the three refuges. And Bodhidharma, of course, is the first Zen patriarch. So obviously indicating that this is the line uh, that I'm in. And we chant the, uh, as I've explained before, we chant the uh, lineage um, because our own it resonates with our own karma um, and our karma is is you know entangled with the uh, uh, karma of all those patriarchs that have gone before going right the way back to to the buddha and it sort of and it settled the matter really for me um you know uh, and it was fascinating because you know it dreams have a dream logic that is um obviously resonant and um, emotional, it has feeling uh, as well, so that the logic isn't just the case of, uh, you know, what is logical and what is not. Um, it does have a logic, there is a thing called dream logic, um, but it's it's by association and, and, and it opens itself up onto a, a, a much bigger realm. Uh, and when I woke up from that dream and pondered it, and in fact I did tell my teacher uh, at the time, and she agreed with uh, the interpretation that I placed on it, uh, that that is, you know, it, it was reorientating me back uh, to this. So now, so the question I suppose that comes from, well, where does the dream actually come from? And this is a very open-ended question, obviously, uh, and depending on one's personal faith or belief, you know, some will believe it is God uh, or a God, a deity or a deva. That's certainly how it has been seen. Um, obviously, in, in Buddhism uh, and certainly in Zen, you know, we uh, the heart is seen. The heart itself is seen as already enlightened, uh, but because of delusion, uh, there's no awareness of this. However, that doesn't mean that the uh, enlightened heart doesn't have agency and doesn't, and it cannot send a message, um, and it cannot be asked. You know, it's not it's not that it cannot be asked a question either and that we cannot ponder something and that an answer cannot arise from the heart and um, this is why we practice sazen this is why we practice daily life practice to to give myself wholeheartedly away into what at this moment is being done means to lay myself down and instead of listening to the noisy racket from the inner film commentator which i am uh, all about what I think and want and uh, should and shouldn't and all this sort of stuff. We allow all that uh, sort of dust to settle and become aware of the heart itself as this sort of wide open, capacious um, quietness. Um, and out of that quiet spaciousness, uh, as Miyakioni used to like to call it, um, then this voice of the heart Buddha can be heard, not just in dreams, but actually in, in ordinary daily life. And, you know, if we were to say, well, what is the purpose of the Zen way? Um, it is to walk in the presence, um, in full awareness uh, of the heart Buddha and being informed by that informing information. Again, another term from Yogyoni. Um, obey it and uh, this is the Buddha's path Buddha himself said 
you know, that he didn't uh, find anything new, but actually rediscovered uh, just an, an ancient path leading to the ancient city, which is called the human heart. So, interesting question. Thank you very much for that question, as usual. Um, if you do have any questions for the troubleshooting series, uh, send them in an email to rinzai at thezengateway.com. That's rinzai, R-I-N-Z-A-I, at thezengateway.com. And, uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.